Welcome to the 3C Live Experience, a dynamic, multiracial, fast-growing church with thousands of believers filled with passion for God and for people. Let's join 3C in this live experience. Church, we're going to get into the Word of God. If you're not already seated, please just take your seats and get out your Bibles and your pens and your notebooks, and we're going to hear what the Lord has to say to us today. And I want to encourage you once again, open up those spiritual ears and say, Holy Spirit of God, teach me your ways. Remember, the Holy Spirit is our chief teacher, and it's our heart that He teaches us His Word today, that we get a revelation of who God is. It's not information that changes your life. It's impartation. And that's what we need today by the power of the Holy Spirit. We need revelation and impartation into our lives. Now, the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the word forgive us, forgive them. And the text was Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, where it says, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. Forgive us, forgive them. Forgive us forgive them. And these last couple of weeks, the Lord has really been dealing with our hearts and speaking to us. And specifically last week, we looked at 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5 and uh, verse 9, where it says, for God did not appoint us to wrath. God has not appointed us to anger or to bitterness or to vengeance. That's not God's appointment within our life, but he has appointed us to reconciliation. And therefore we saw in two Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18 that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. He's given us the, the word of reconciliation. Rather than call to wrath and vengeance, God has called us to a ministry of reconciliation. Today I want to speak about how do we deal with offense. And therefore today's message is offense must fall. Offense must fall. Come on, say it with me. Offense must fall. Offense must say it in. Come on. Say, offense must fall. Offense One more time. Fall. Offense must fall. Offense must right? fall. So the scripture we're looking at is Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15. And it says there, moreover, if your brother sins against you, um, the Bible says you must go and tell him his fault between him and you alone. He has the key word, alone. And the Bible says that if he hears you, if he hears you, he, you, you have gained a brother. But if he will not hear, what do you do? Now, this takes to the, the next level. So if he does not listen to you, what do you do? Now you take with you one or two more that by the mouth of, of two or three uh, witnesses, every word may then be established. And then the Bible says, and if then he refuses to hear, what do you do? Now you tell it to the church. And if he refuses to even hear the church, the Bible says, let, let it be to him like a, like a heathen and, and like a tax collector. Now, now, I want us also to look at uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 23. So, so these two texts, um, uh, this is the, the, the foundation of what we're going to speak about today. So Matthew 5 and verse 23 to 24 says, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, um, you, you know, you might be in church and, and you're at the altar or in your prayer time, um, in your devotional time, if you're at the altar and you're worshiping the Lord and there you remember that your brother has something against you. Now note, the first scripture that we looked at, we saw that, um, we, we saw that, that if, you, if your brother has sinned, against you. In other words, your brother, there, there's offense. You are offended with your brother, then you go and sort it out. But now he's talking about vice versa. If your brother has something against you. So when you're offended, the Bible says you need to sort it out. And when you know someone else is offended, you have to go sort it out. So keep that in mind. So he says, if your brother has something against you, what does the Bible say? Verse 24, he says, leave your gift there before the altar, he says, go your way, first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Then come and offer your gift. So once again, two things. Matthew 18 and verse 15, if your brother sins against you. In other words, your brother has hurt you. He has offended you. You are offended. If you are offended, he says, it's your responsibility to go sort it out. And then he says, if your brother 
has something against you. So if your brother is offended, what must you do? Ah, you also have to go sort it out. How's that for a revelation? So as a Christian, let me say that again. If your brother has sinned against you, the Bible says, go and tell him his fault. In other words, you have the responsibility. If your brother has sinned against you, you have the responsibility to go and make sure that there is reconciliation. Not appointed to vengeance, to reconciliation. Then, what does it say? And if your brother has something against you, what do you need to do? If, in other words, when you're offended, you gotta sort it out. When your brother's offended, what do you need to do? You need to sort it out. So you can never claim that you are not responsible. Each and every one of us has a responsibility to peace and a responsibility to reconciliation. Say with me, offense must fall. Offense Come on, say it again. Say, offense must fall. Come offense on, say it again. Offense must, offense must fall. Now, nobody enjoys confronting others. Nobody loves conflict. Yet, from time to time, the church's health depends upon it. Your relationships depend upon it. And, uh, you know, your first response is, you know, have you sat with somebody one-on-one -on -one and talked through the issues. 95% of the time, the answer is no. By, you know, we, we avoid the problem. But when we avoid the problem, we aggravate it. We allow bitterness to fester. Uh, misunderstandings start occurring and falsehoods start to spread. And, and, and therefore, it is of utmost importance that we deal with the issues. There, that's why, once again, if you're offended, you're responsible. If someone else is offended, you also are responsible. We cannot leave it. We have to get to one another. Now, one thing I have found is that offense most often comes from those that are closest to you. <laughs> the people closest to you are the ones that can hurt you the most. It's those you care about that hurt you, you, you know, because you've given them your heart, you've given them your trust, and then they, they fail you. In actual fact, if you speak to, you know, attorneys, they will tell you that the most nasty, hurtful, uh, cases in courts are, are usually in the divorce courts. And if you look at family violence uh, within our nations, it makes up a big percentage of violent crimes committed in homes by, 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 by desperate family members that have been hurt or been angered. And, you know, the home that's supposed to be the shelter of protection, the place of provision, a place of, of growth where we're supposed to learn and uh, learn to give and receive love is often the very place that is the root of our pain. Uh, even looking at history, history shows us that the bloodiest of wars are civil wars. In other words, domestic wars where it's brother against brother, where it's son against father, father against son, domestically fighting against one another. And so with, within the nation, the, the nastiest of fights, the bloodiest of fights is within a nation or a community when we, we're, we're neighbors fighting with one another because, it's, because the hurt is so deep. When a brother that he stays across the road or a brother that is close to you in the same neighborhood or of the, the same persuasion um, that has been walk, walking with you comes and betrays your trust. And how much more the church? Wow, isn't that a place where we can see a lot of hurt and pain? Because it's a place where we don't expect it. It's a place where we've given people our hearts it's a place, it's our spiritual, our, our spiritual family where we've opened up our hearts, we've opened up our, you know, ourselves and that's a place where you can get hurt. And thus we see that those who you care about are usually the ones um, that can really, really hurt you. Why? You expect more of them. After all, you know, you've given them more of yourself. The higher the expectations, the greater the fall and the greater, the greater the hurt. And that's why we see so many wounded, hurt people, bitter people, uh, people that are so offended, but they don't realize that when you allow offense within your life, listen to this, you have fallen into the devil's trap. That's the devil's trap. He entraps us, how? through offense. 
And that is the, the, the key word when it comes, that's the key strategy of the devil. Divide and conquer, divide and conquer. If he can divide a church, he can divide a cell, divide a family, divide a marriage, divide a nation. See, when he brings division, he can now conquer. That's why we see in, in the Bible, everything that God speaks about has to, do, um, has to do with unity, having one heart. So we look at 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and uh, verse 24 to 26. He says, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel. <laughs> there you go. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel. He says, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. In humility, in humility, not in a sense of superiority that I am better than you and let me tell you what to do. No, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, listen to this, that they may come to their senses, listen to this, and escape the snare, the entrapment of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Who's taken him captive? The devil. The devil takes people captive. He entraps them by the snare. And those who are in quarrels, that's because he uses this, the term quarrels. That's why we mustn't quarrel. Those who are in quarrels or, or opposition, what do we do? We fall into that trap and what? We help prisoner. We help prisoner to do the devil's will. And even more alarming, you know, is that we're, we're unaware of it. You're unaware of the captivity. You're unaware that the devil has got you because you have taken offense within your life. You have taken offense and allowed the devil to put your life on pause. And we think that everything is still okay. We're still going on and, and doing our thing and living our life, but your life is on pause. As soon as you take offense, Everything in your life stops because now you have rendered the blood of Jesus useless. Because the Bible says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that have trespassed against us. Forgive us, remember, and forgive them. Now, once you've taken offense, your life goes on pause and you can continue in the word of God. You can continue coming to church. You can continue interceding and you continue fasting and you continue praying and you're doing all the spiritual things that you think is helping you to develop and grow. And guess what? Your life is going nowhere because from the day that you took offense, your life has stopped. And that's why many of you, you still caught in 1999 when you had that bad experience. Some of you are still in the 90s. Some of you are in the 80s. Some of you, you know, you're still in last year. You still, and you think that, you know, as you go through the process, as you still stuck, some of you still stuck from the day that you got divorced or the day you got retrenched. You still stuck in that day or that day that somebody wrote an email and sent it out to everybody. You still stuck on that day or the day that your spouse betrayed you. You still stuck in that day. And from that day, your life has been on pause and you can go through all the spiritual rigmarole and think that you're spiritual, but you're fooling yourself. Your life is on pause. That's the trap of the devil. And guess what? You're entrapped to do the will. This is what the Bible says. Having been taken captive by him to do his will. So let's go on. And don't worry, don't feel condemned. We're going to take it to the next level because I'm going to help you deal with this. How does offense start? Offense usually starts with a thought. And thoughts are, are seeds. And, and that, that thought enters into your mind. And the seed and this thought starts germinating and it develops into an offense within our lives. But I've got good news for you. We have the ability to refuse the thought or uproot the seed before the offense becomes fully grown in the garden of our hearts. So we've got to understand, offense 
is a spiritual seed. And there's a few ways that, that these seeds can get sown into our lives. First of all, uh, it's got to do with what others have said to us. It can be cutting words, abrasive words, sarcastic words that have pierced you like a sword. You know, or it could be what others have not said because you're offended because you don't feel appreciated or no, uh, somebody didn't say thank you, somebody didn't compliment your effort. Um, it could also, it's got to do with others did towards us. Negative actions, selfish actions, humiliating experience you've gone through of, uh, brings that seed of offense that germinate within our heart. Um, and then it's also got to do with what people didn't do for us. In other words, they weren't there for you. Uh, might, maybe your parents weren't there for you or somebody wasn't there to cover you or to protect you. But what happens is the seed produces a root of bitterness. And when this a bad weed grows, it starts producing fruit of resentment. Fruit of bitterness brings forth fruit of resentment. And that's why I want us to look at, at Hebrews chapter 12, very powerful scripture. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14, and it says the following. It says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord, right? Let me say it again. Pursue peace. Say with me, pursue peace. Pursue peace. Come on, say it again. Say pursue peace. Pursue peace. Say this with me. Pursue peace with all people. Pursue peace with Did I say people. all people? Yes, all people and holiness. And he says, without that, you will not see the Lord. Now look at the next verse. It says, looking carefully, lest anyone should fall short of the grace of God. Listen to this. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and by this many become defiled. So let's look at this. He says, there's a root of bitterness. And this root of bitterness doesn't just defile you. It defiles everybody around you. So if we go to the Webster Dictionary and we look at the, the word root, it speaks about the underground part of the plant, right? We all mostly, uh, when we talk about a, a, a plant, the, the roots underground, which means you can't see it. It functions as an organ of absorption, so it absorbs. Um, uh, it functions as, as an organ of aeration, in other words, bringing uh, uh, life and oxygen. And, uh, and it is a place of food storage, so it stores the food. And it's a means of anchorage, so it keeps the plant anchored. So the first thing is, when you talk about a root of bitterness, usually you can't see it. See, many people are bitter, but you can't see above ground. You can't see the bitterness. But you see, this bitterness um, feeds every part of the tree. So usually, a person, you can't always see the bitterness. In other words, you can't always identify it from the naked eye, from normal living. The second thing I found with this definition, very powerful, is that it's an organ of absorption. In other words, it absorbs everything it needs to feed the body, to feed the plant. So whatever it absorbs is what it gives out to the tree and even the fruit of the tree is affected by what the roots feed it. So if we talk about absorption, if there is bitterness, See, what happens is that bitterness affects your whole life. It affects every relationship that you have. Because the root, if there's a root of bitterness, you think, well, I limit it to the individual, but you, it's not the individual. See, when you're talking about a root, it affects your life. Everything you touch is affected. Everything you feed is affected. Every word you say is affected. Every action you have is affected. Your whole life is affected when there is a root of bitterness. Now you might not think, because once again, it's underground. You see, you might not think that it affects everything, but it does because the root absorbs and then it feeds the whole plant. 
it's also an organ of aeration. So it feeds the oxygen. It feeds, it feeds the life. So imagine you're talking about a poisonous root that is poisoned. It poisons the whole tree. It poisons your whole life. It poisons your workplace. It poisons your family. It poisons your marriage. And then if we talk about the, the aeration, which is the oxygen, the roots also give the oxygen. Now, if you think about gas, um, you know, oxygen gives you life, but carbon dioxide, you know, kills. So if you've got poisonous gas, poisonous life, it destroys everything you have. And you're wondering why everything is always going wrong. Why do bad things always happen to me? Why is nothing ever coming right? Well, let's look at the root. Is there a root of bitterness within your life? Once again, absorption, what you feed. And then, of course, it says, you know, the life. And that affects everything, all your relationships, everything you are and do. And then it says, and the root is also a means of anchorage. It's the support. It was, it's what anchors you in life. But you see, if the root is rotten, if the root is rotten, it's not going to anchor your life. If the root is rotten, it's not going to anchor you. And it won't take too long. And you, your life will be destroyed. And therefore, whenever the seed of offense is sown into your life and you allow it to germinate into a root of bitterness, you know, the, the, the fruit thereof is always resentment. And that's why it will always display in whatever you say, in all your words, being critical, gossiping, being aggressive, always judging everybody around you, always blaming uh, everybody around you. Offense is that spiritual weed that has to be taken out of our lives. Say with me, offense must fall. Offense Come on, say it again, fall. offense must fall. Offense so it's displayed in what you say and it's displayed in what you do. The works of the flesh. The works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, Paul lists 17 things, you know, as the works of the flesh. I'm just going to mention a few. He says, sexual immorality, sexual impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, je uh, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissent, uh, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and all other sins like this. You see, when, when you're offended, you open your life to sin. And often when we're uh, 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 offended, what do we do? We see ourselves as victims. We start blaming others. And what do we do? We use our offense as an excuse or a license to sin and do just what we want, how we want. And we justify our bitterness. We justify our unforgiveness. We justify our anger and envy and resentment uh, and resentment within our life. And that causes us as, as excuses to sin just as we want to. We do just what we want. Why? Because we hurt. <laughs> now we can do what we want. We can be violent. We can destroy. We can curse. We can betray. We can be disloyal. And, and sometimes we even resent those who remind us of others, you know, uh, that have hurt us. And then what do we do? We then also entice others to take offense on our behalf. I mean, really, that is like, you know, having sin buddies. And that's just like the devil. The devil doesn't want to go to hell alone. <laughs> he wants to, he, he makes sure that he's taking others with him. He knows he's going to hell, but he doesn't want to go to hell alone. And so we find with others. You see, when you're in that place, you try to find a sin buddy. You want to get an offense buddy. You're trying to get people to take offense on your behalf. And they're not even in the situation. Now you start gossiping. You start putting people down. You speak words. And rather than bringing reconciliation, you rather pull somebody else into your mess. And you tempt them to become just like you, to hate like you, to be bitter like you. And get a sin buddy. And just like the devil, he wants to take people to hell. Therefore, offense blinds. Let me tell you, offense blinds you. It blinds you to the true reality. And only a revelation of the love and the goodness of God can set you free. And when the Holy Spirit then gives us that revelation and we allow the Holy Spirit to work within our heart, you see, now we can deal with offense. It brings conviction, not condemnation, See, when the Holy Spirit comes and works with them, like, the Holy Spirit doesn't bring condemnation. The devil brings condemnation. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. And when there's conviction, 
you need to deal with it. See, condemnation means you don't think there's, there's no hope. There's no hope, but that means you don't believe in God. But conviction that you are wrong, conviction that you messed up, you can still do something about it. And that's what I want to, uh, to take us to the next part of this message. And that's with the dealing of offense. How do we deal with offense? What does the Bible say about dealing with offense? So remember the two scriptures that we, that we dealt with starting off. First of all, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And remember Matthew chapter five and verse 23 that says, if you have come to the altar and you have a gift and remember that your brother has something against you, what must you do? Leave your gift before the altar and go your way. So, so we see that there is a responsibility that we have to talk to the other person. Now, what I have found that most people do is they go talk with everybody else except, except the person involved. You phone everybody else. You speak to everybody else except to the person who has offended you or except to the person um, that has taken offense. But we will speak to everybody else. And you're speaking to mommy and you're speaking to daddy and you're speaking to brother and you're speaking to auntie and you're speaking to your friend at school and your BFF and you're talking to everybody and you've spoken to about 100 people but you haven't spoken to the individual itself. Now that is called gossip. That sows destruction. And the Bible says, in uh, Proverbs chapter 17 and verse nine, it says there that he who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. Are you hearing me? He who repeats a matter separates friends. I'll say it again. He who repeats a matter does what? Separates friends. So you're gonna make sure you go address it with the person involved, the person alone. Not everybody with them, you. It's private, private. You're not trying to expose. Proverbs 17 verse nine says, he who covers a transgression, which means what? You go speak to the individual alone and you try work it out alone. But now if you repeat it, if you repeat it, what are you doing? You sowing destruction. How much destruction have you sown? Gossip. How much destruction have you sown? You want another scripture? Proverbs chapter uh, 16 and verse 28. Listen to this. He says, a perverse man sows strife and a whisperer separates the best of friends. A whisperer separates the best of friends. I like what Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 28 says in the New Living Translation. It says there that a troublemaker plants seeds of strife. He says, but a, and, and a gossip separates the best of friends. You've you got you to hear me here today. That you've got to speak to that person and you've got to speak to that person alone. You and that individual. Don't be a gossip. Don't be a troublemaker. Don't be a whisperer. And try get somebody to sit in your hole there with you. Stop trying to get a sin buddy. That's what we want. We want to be offended and we want to stay offended. And what do we do? We, we entice people to then, and we tempt people like the devil. We tempt others and entice others to take offense on our behalf. That's a gossip. That's a whisperer. And you know what? Here's the thing. What you sow, you shall reap. You sow disloyalty and strife and trouble your whole life is gonna be trouble. You're never gonna have a great relationship with nobody. You're not gonna have a great marriage. You're gonna struggle with your children. You're gonna struggle in every relationship that you have for your whole life. Because if that is your uh, uh, modest operandi where you are a gossip and a whisperer, whatever you sow, that you shall also reap. With the same measure that you measure will be measured back to you. Say to me, offense must fall. Offense Come on, fall. say it again. Offense must fall. Offense Come on, one more time. Fall. Offense must fall. Offense must fall. So, so, how to resolve conflict? You go and you speak to that person and you go talk to that person individually and you go spend time with them. Now, 
when you're talking to that person, so point number one, talk to the person. Secondly, make sure that when you're speaking to this person, you need to listen carefully. Listen carefully. Seek to understand. Don't seek to be righteous. Don't seek to be right. Listen to me. Right is overrated. Right is overrated. You see, you, the, the objective is not being right. The objective is reconciliation. That's actually the next point. The focus of the objective is reconciliation. But point two, uh, uh, James chapter one and verse 19 in the New Living Translation says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, that you must be quick to listen, you must be slow to speak, and the Bible says, and you must be slow to get angry. Quick, slow, slow, right? Quick, slow, slow. Got it? Quick, slow, slow. Quick to listen. Slow to speak and slow to get angry. So when you are meeting somebody, the purpose is not to get them to say sorry. The purpose of meeting is not to get someone to apologize to you. That's not the purpose. So when you go meet this person alone, the person, that's not the purpose. What is the purpose? The purpose is reconciliation. That's the objective. The objective then is reconciliation. That's point number three. Make sure that your purpose is reconciliation. So coming back to, to point number two, listen carefully, seek to understand, don't seek to be right. You know, I always think about, uh, you know, when I was a young boy, and this lesson I learned very quickly in my life. Uh, we would go play, you know, in the field, we would play, play soccer. And, um, and uh, there was usually, you know, one of the boys who owned the ball. If we made the guy mad, he would pick up his ball and he'd say, right, <laughs> I'm done. Okay, it's over. So we'd say, hey, it was out. He would say, no, it was in. We'd say, no, it was out. It was, uh, no, no, it was in. Then he said, well, then okay. Well, then I take my ball. And off he goes and he takes his ball. Now, the objective is not to win. The objective is to play soccer. You see, he takes his ball. You know, we can't play. We, there is no soccer. We don't, so at the end of the day, it's not about being right. See, what's the real win? The real win is not the winning and scoring the goal. The real win is the ability to enjoy a game of soccer. And that's why many times we, 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 we misconstrue the objective. The objective is not necessary to be the winner. The objective is to have a good game of soccer. And if the guy takes his ball, it doesn't matter. You might say, well, it's not right, uh, injustice and claim justice. No, it's his ball. And whether he's right or wrong, if he takes his ball, he takes his ball and guess what? No soccer. So it doesn't matter. It's not your rules. The world we live in is not our rules. Now, there is godly justice, but you've got to understand that we're looking for reconciliation. We're looking at getting along. We're looking at, at, at playing together and being together. And therefore, let's make sure that we're not seeking to be right. But that brings me to point number three. The focus of the objective is reconciliation. What is the focus? Reconciliation. And that's why Romans 14 and verse 19, it says that, uh, that we must pursue the things which make for peace. What? Pursue the things which make for peace and the things which are of one that may edify one another. So peace and edification. Why? It's because your motive determines your attitude. What's your motive? If we go with an attitude of frustration, let me tell you, you will not promote peace. Uh, we'll only make it difficult and, and, and uh, for the one who's hurt. And let me tell you, then it starts escalating and escalating and then you get offended, the other person gets offended, then you get more offended, then they get more offended and then you get more offended. No, no, we've got to have an attitude of pursuing peace through humility at the expense of our pride. That's it. It's not about me. It's not about my righteousness. It's not about me being right. It's about peace. And that's the only way we see true, uh, 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 true reconciliation. 
So, so once again, we've got to talk to the person, listen carefully, seek to understand, focus on the objective, which is reconciliation, number three, and then four, identify points of agreement and disagreement. In other words, while you're there, you can take the points and uh, uh, identify them. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because, of course, you can talk about this forever. Identify the points of agreement and disagreement. Then prioritize the, the, the places that, that, that bring forth the conflict. And then work a strategy and a plan um, to work through the conflict. Now, obviously, you know, this is in the workplace. This is your marriage. This is as far as the children are concerned. But we need to deal with the issues. We're not going to be in agreement in everything. But you see, the plan and the, the, the purpose, the objective is reconciliation. So prioritize the areas of conflict. Then get a plan to work on every area of the conflict. And then together make a decision that you're going to follow through on the plan. Let me give you those points again. Talk with the other person. Listen carefully. Focus on the objective, which is reconciliation. Identify the points of agreement and disagreement. Prioritize the areas of conflict and then get a plan to work through that conflict and then make sure that you follow through on the plan. In other words, do what you agreed. It doesn't help that you agreed and then you don't do what you agree. You see, that, that doesn't work either. So then you do what you agree. So that's your priority when you meet somebody alone. The objective is reconciliation. Now the Bible says in verse 16, and I'm starting to close with this. The Bible says, but if he will not hear, what do you do? You take one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So if you don't get breakthrough, many times either of you could not see possibly don't see the greater picture. And if you don't see the greater picture, it's good to bring in somebody, bring in your leader, uh, bring in your pastor, uh, that is another witness. You can allow the other party to also bring in somebody, that you can sit and then discuss it. And once again, it's not two teams against one another where you're trying to gang up on one another. Remember, the objective is reconciliation. So what do you do? You get somebody, you bring somebody in and you bring the leader, you bring them in. So two or three witnesses. Then the Bible says, if that person with the witnesses, so once again, you brought, you've dealt with the person that has sinned against you, you've brought in witnesses and they confirm what you've said. Then the Bible says, now bring it before the church, bring it before the church. And then if they still do not want to repent. In other words, they are causing pain, they're causing destruction, and they still don't want to hear. The Bible says, when it comes to this, the Bible says, then you put somebody like that out of the church. In other words, now obviously, you know, that's very rare that that really happens because the goal is always reconciliation. But there are consequences. You can take somebody off ministry. You can take somebody off leadership. You can take someone until they've sorted things out in their lives. And, and remember, it's never about punishment. It's always about uh, uh, rehabilitation. It's always about correction. It's always about empowerment. It is never, the goal is never negative. It's always grace. It's always mercy. But once again, if we come to that place and that does not happen, then we need to make sure that we deal with it. Now, I close off with this. Verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go speak, you and him alone. And if he hears you, the Bible says you have gained a brother. Matthew 5 and 23, 24, it says, if your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar. He says, first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Everything has to do with reconciliation. God has not called us and appointed us to wrath, but God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. God has given us the word of reconciliation. And once again, your responsibility to deal with the person when you are offended, you're responsible. And when you know someone else has taken offense with you, the Bible says you are also responsible that is normal Christianity. That is what God expects of us. That's what it means to love people. And he says, by this shall men know that you are my disciples is the love 
that you have for one another. Isn't that powerful? I believe that you have been... This 3C Live experience was brought to you by the 3C Media Production. For more information, call us on 086-111-2345 or log on to my3c.tv. Or you could write to us at PO Box 10508 Centurion 0046 or email us at tv at my3c.tv. If you need prayer, SMS the word PRAY followed by your prayer request to 33347 and our team of prayer warriors will pray for you for 30 days. If you would like to become a partner with the ministry, SMS the word PARTNER to 33347 and one of our team members will get back to you within the next few days. You can follow Pastors Bert and Shane Pretorius on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram to be inspired daily by morning devotions, ministry updates and much, much more. Log on to my3c.tv for more information.